The world of mobile technology is one of the fiercest competitive markets ever. In the quest to stand out from the pack, some companies make bold moves and succeed brilliantly. Others are more meek and fade into the unexceptional background. Still others fill the space between, innovating once and then endlessly iterating over and over again. Then there are those that just screw it all up, thanks to choices that are either too bold, too meek, or just plain old absolutely insane. These are the products that fall flat on their face. They're not to be mocked, but the lessons they teach should certainly be remembered. And that's what we're here for. I'm Michael Fisher, this is Pocket Now, and this is episode one of Worst Gadgets Ever. So back in February of 2011, Sprint announced an industry-first event that they were really trying to make a big deal out of. Uh, when journalists got to the event, they found David Blaine in a tank of water on stage, sitting underwater, holding his breath for something like almost eight minutes, and coughing up goldfish and lighting cigars underwater. And yeah, uh, Sprint was setting the stage for a magical unveiling, and they threw a lot of weight behind it. And what we ended up getting was the Kyocera Echo. As a refresher, let's take a brief hardware tour. In its closed position, the Echo looks like a... Well, there's no real way of getting around it. The Echo looks like a complete dumpster fire. Uh, an offset LCD panel in front here is flanked by two metal inlays, top and bottom, below which sits three capacitive buttons for the Froyo build of Android that was already a bit dated at the time of release. Taking a spin around the sides and back here, you can see that the industrial design is... Um, Absent. Kyocera has never had the best eye for design, if you ask me, and the Echo is the finest example of that. This thing is brutal, with, with sharp corners and seams galore, cheap buttons on the side, and it's, it's a heavy, heavy brick. Part of the reason for that added thickness and weight, of course, if the Echo's headline feature weren't in, uh, obvious enough, popping the unit open reveals, first off, that it's a very cumbersome unit to open, but eventually the hinge locks into place and your bulky, cumbersome, oversized phone becomes a bulky, cumbersome, undersized tablet. Sort of. Speaking of that hinge, uh, this isn't broken or anything. This is how the hinge sits in its deployed position. It makes putting the Echo down on a desk or a table, uh, frankly, a ridiculous experience, uh, akin to a busted seesaw. It even feels wrong in its pseudo-laptop, half-deployed position, like this. Kyocera made a big deal at the announcement about how many patents they had on this ridiculously over-engineered super copper alloy hinge. Uh, six, if you care. It was clearly the high point of their design prowess, and it's just so, so awkward. I mean, it feels durable, but it's definitely not the finest example of engineering I've ever seen. In all, the hardware on the Echo is a great example of how not all bold design choices are good design choices. That's lesson number one for the day. But that's only half the story here. The Echo's big software advantage was supposed to be this ability to simultask, and yes, that is a copyrighted term, which Kyocera was pushing as this new, powerful way to multitask within Android. Now, back in the day, in the pre-ICS time period, when Android multitasking was not as visually elegant, this seemed poised to be quite a big value add. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. As with most specialized software builds, the Echo's custom software had its limitations. Only certain apps could simultask, which was accessed by tapping both screens at the same time. In stock configuration, the simultask available apps included only the browser, phone book, email, gallery, messaging, phone, and Kyocera's custom QView or ViewQ app, which lets you watch videos while browsing other videos. Running two apps side by side doesn't sound like rocket science today, with Samsung's new Galaxy Note 10.1 offering side by side app running ability and Windows Snap features starting to bleed into tablets. But this was early 2011 and the Echo was trying to address a gap in the market that really needed addressing. Outside of WebOS, the lack of elegant multitasking on smartphones was a real problem that needed solving. 
The problem, it wasn't elegant. The dual tap to open of the multitasking menu meant multi-touch was enabled in some apps and it was disabled in some other apps, some crucial apps in tablet mode, like the gallery. Sure, you could watch videos while you were taking care of other business, but the pitiful number of apps which supported the feature meant you couldn't, say, check your email with the Gmail app while doing anything else. You had to use the stock built-in app. Not a great experience. And the simultasking app selection never widened because people could tell quite early that this phone wasn't really going anywhere. Really, how could it? With a bezel thin, but still there, bisecting the displays in a so-called tablet mode, even normal usage without simultasking wasn't enjoyable. And tablet mode still only yielded a 4.7 inch diagonal screen area. More square, sure, and okay for the time, but much smaller than the more utilitarian phablet screens that started showing up in devices like the Galaxy Note. And while we can't ding the device too hard for its lack of responsiveness, I mean, this was the era of Froyo after all, it needs to be said, the Echo was a laggy, laggy phone. Frame drops and skips and general sluggishness pervade the OS. Also, there was never much pretty about Froyo, and the Echo's hardware and custom skin don't do it any favors. If you're going to try to build next-generation hardware, don't saddle it with half-baked software. That's lesson number two. In all, it's hard to demolish the Kyocera Echo. Not because it's a bad device, I mean, this thing is a train wreck, but because I hate coming down on companies that try something new. There's so little that's new and exciting in smartphone hardware these days. We've written about it countless times at Pocket Now. Everything's a variation on the same dull slate with a big display. So it's always nice to see a company really strive to do something different, fun, and interesting. And on paper, the Echo was all of that. A phone with a hinge that carried six pending patents, dual screens that transformed into a tablet when you wanted it to, it sounded like every geek's dream come true. Unfortunately, where it stumbled was in execution. And those stumbles were bad enough and big enough that the obituaries were being written almost as soon as the Echo launched. Unfortunately, in the world of mobile technology, as elsewhere, it's not just about what looks good on paper, it's about what actually works well in the real world. The Kyocera Echo didn't. Folks, I'm Michael Fisher from PocketNow.com. That's going to do it for episode one of Worst Gadgets Ever. Thanks for watching. Throw us a thumbs up here on YouTube if you liked what you saw. If you have a comment or a suggestion on another device we should cover, uh, we are going to be doing more episodes in this series. Please leave us a comment on the post at PocketNow.com, not here on YouTube. We don't check them very often. Or you can send me an email, Michael at PocketNow.com. Or you can follow us on Twitter. Actually, please follow us on Twitter. We're at PocketNowTweets for the official account. Uh, I am at Captain Two Phones. That's Captain, the number two phones. You can also find Pocket Now on Facebook, on Google Plus, anywhere there's a social media outlet. We are there. I want to thank you once again for watching, and stay tuned for the next episode. It's coming soon. Thanks again.